Hey everybody, it's Lon Seibin. One of my favorite video game systems of all time was the original Game Boy. I got mine back in 1989 and the idea that you could bring games with you with interchangeable cartridges was amazing because at that time the only portable games we had were those lousy Tiger handhelds. And today what we're going to do is build ourselves our own Game Boy that runs on an FPGA thanks to a new kit that I bought over at Retro Gaming Repair Shop made by a company called Funny Playing. And this is a replica of the Game Boy Color and it uses an FPGA for accurate recreation of the Game Boy logic. So when we're done, we'll have something that looks like this but with a much better screen. This in fact is my original Game Boy Color. We're gonna dive into this in just a second. I got the big box of stuff here to go through in a second. But before we do, I wanna let you know in the interest of full disclosure that I paid for the kit with my own funds. All the opinions you're about to hear are my own. No one is paying for this review, nor has anyone reviewed or approved what you're about to see before it was uploaded. So let's get into it now, starting with the parts that you need to get to make this kit work. Now, when all is said and done here, this will probably cost about $110 to $120 with shipping. You can order direct from Funny Playing overseas. That might cost a little bit less, but I have good luck with these guys over in Rhode Island, so I went with them. And what we're gonna do here is just kind of pick out the parts so you know what to get. So the first thing, of course, is to get the kit, which will consist of the motherboard, the display, and the speaker. So you add that to your cart here. But then you also need to get a casing for it. I went with the clear black one here, but they've got some other ones like atomic purple and other different colors that you might wanna get here. So you need to add that to the mix. Additionally, what you need are some controller uh, components, and those are not on this page here. So what you have to do is scroll down a little bit and look for the silicon button contact membranes. They're only about three bucks a piece here. And you pick out your color and then add it to your cart. And then you also need to get the actual plastic controller pieces as well. So what you can do here is scroll down to the bottom and you'll see uh, Funny Playing Game Boy custom buttons and you can get your control pad and the other buttons that you need to make it all work. And once you got all that and check out, you will get a box of stuff here. So let's take a look and see what these things look like. All right, so here is the motherboard. And as you can see, it's got a cartridge slot for an original Game Boy cartridge and the FPGA right here. And then of course, on the other side, you have your contacts for the controller portion. Now, one thing they ask you not to do is short out this section right here when you're testing. So what I'm gonna do is actually put the whole thing together and then test it without screwing anything down. This requires no soldering, so there's very little you can do to screw it up but you can, again, screw things up if you happen to short out that section there. So that is the motherboard component. Also in the box here is the casing that I chose. I went with a black one here, and I'll open it up here so you can see what it looks like. It actually feels very nice. It doesn't feel like something that was 3D printed, and this is designed specifically for the funny playing motherboard here. So there you go, you can see what it looks like. I think these also work with regular Game Boy hardware, because a lot of people buy these uh, new casings to accommodate larger displays without having to cut things out. So there is a battery compartment here, although uh, this kit also comes with a battery, and this is what's required for it to work. It is rechargeable, and the motherboard has a USB-C connector here on the bottom to charge it with. So this is the battery that it uses. You cannot use AA batteries like the original here did. And then, what else do we have in here? Here are the membranes for the controllers. This will probably be the last uh, step of our assembly here. And then I have uh, the screen, and this is part of the kit. And the screen, as you'll see in a minute, will install onto this front portion, and then the ribbon cable here will connect to the motherboard. And it does have some plastic on it that I'll leave on until I'm ready to boot it up and peel everything off there. There are some screws here for final assembly. And then we have the buttons that I purchased as well. I went with clear uh, black plastic to kind of match the casing here. And what's fun is that you can pick out all sorts of different colors and find something that works best for you. And here is our speaker with what looks like a little rubber band here. Hopefully that didn't break something. Um, and I will get that assembled as well. And that, of course, will live 
inside of the speaker housing here. So why don't we uh, start getting this thing assembled and see if it all works. Now they didn't provide any instructions for how to put this thing together. So we're gonna just kind of wing it here and see how we end up. I'm gonna start though with the display and there are some adhesive strips here on the back of the display that I'm gonna peel in a minute. But basically what this does is that the lower portion of the display slides underneath the plastic here and then it just goes in like so and the adhesive is going to hold it in place and then we have the ribbon cable here exposed so that we can plug it into the motherboard. So what I'm going to do here real quick is just peel off the uh, tape uh, adhesive thing here and get that going. So we'll take that one off and then we'll do the other one here and get that going. And once we get that peeled off, we can uh, get this thing situated into its permanent home, hopefully here. And this is why I would also recommend leaving the uh, film on the front here because you will be handling the display a bit. So it's a good safety measure here to prevent it from getting too messed up. So let me get the rest of the tape here figured out and we'll come back when it's adhered. All right, so we got the tape situated there. So we're going to go ahead and just slide that in and give it a nice press down here so it's flush to the case. So our display is now installed and we've got the ribbon cable here ready to go. They may have also noticed a black piece of plastic here that is inserted into the top of the case here. And that aligns with where the infrared transmitter used to be on the original Game Boy Color. This does not appear to have that feature, although there are some pads here, once my camera focuses, that looks like maybe there's a way to install one later if you were to get one. I don't know of too many games that made use of that, but this doesn't have that. So the piece that is installed on here is just kind of a spacer unit so that it doesn't have a big hole in the case. But it looks like there might be an option for that in the future. Now we're not going to attach the battery to the motherboard just yet because we still want to get our display and our speaker installed. So we're going to do that part last. But what I'm going to do next here is get the display attached. And I did attach it actually off camera because it was hard to demonstrate on camera. I did try. So we've got the ribbon cable here coming off the display. This is the connector on the motherboard that it goes to. And what you want to do is have the pins face down and get them underneath the white plastic piece here. And this brown component here is a bit firm, so you can kind of push against it and that will snap into the connector. You'll feel it connect. It's got a nice feel to it when it makes the right contact. So you will feel that go in, it will insert itself and the display is as good as installed. Next thing we're gonna do here is get our speaker installed. I'm gonna put that rubber gasket in there first. I'm guessing that's probably what goes in first there. And then we'll rest the speaker down on top of it. And as you can see here, we've got a, a cable coming off the speaker, which will of course get installed onto the motherboard as well in a second. So that looks like it's in place. Next, I'm gonna put my buttons on because we are going to attach everything here. Now there is a notch on the D-pad here so you can get it into the right spot. And then on top of that, we're gonna put our membrane here on top of it so that when we move the D-pad here, those will make contact with the motherboard. Next, we're going to install our buttons. So we've got to put in our select and start button here. And these actually have the membrane already built into the button. They're rubber like the original was, so we'll just slide those in there. And then next we've got our B and A button. I gotta make sure I get the order right here. So the one closest to the D-pad is the B button. They are labeled on there. And they are kind of keyed, so they only go in one way. And then of course the A button is further away from the D-pad, and that goes in like so. And then we'll attach the membrane onto that and get that ready to go. So let's get that attached here. All right, so I think we're good there. So now we have all of our buttons installed. And I think the only other thing we have to do is get the power button attached, but I'm gonna do that I think after I figure out how everything comes together here. So I'm just gonna place this down and get this situated properly. And as you can tell, I'm not the best builder of things in the world, especially when I don't have instructions. <laughs> so we're doing our best here. Um, but once I get this thing aligned properly, I will come back and we'll continue the build here. All right, so things are finally coming together here. I've got everything aligned. What really helps is to uh, look for where these screw holes are and get everything 
lined up with the case because that's how it'll all come together in the end. The next step here is I'm going to attach the speaker. Uh, this cable only goes in one way, so you shouldn't have any issue there. So that is done. And now what we're going to do is get the rest of the case assembled here. What you want to do before you put it, on, put it all back together here is to take the power switch that is part of your uh, kit of buttons here and get that aligned with the switch on the motherboard. So now that I've got that installed, when I flick the switch up and down, it will power on and off. And that will, of course, uh, work a lot better once the whole thing is put together here. And now what we're going to do is get the uh, upper case here uh, aligned and ready to go. Now, of course, we do have to attach the battery to it first, so we're going to do that, and this is kind of the moment of truth. Now, as I was getting everything screwed down and put together here, I realized you don't have to have the battery installed until after you're done assembling the case, which is what I have done here. So it's going to be hard for me to demo the installation of the cable on camera here, but right here where I'm pointing, it's open so you can drop in the battery connector without having to take everything apart. So if down the road you need to swap out the battery, you can do it really easily without having to disassemble the entire device. Now the red cable needs to be facing you, and what you do is you just place the cable on top of the connector and push it down, and that's all you need to do to get it connected. It's going to be really hard for me to do this on camera, uh, just given all the contortions I'd have to do. So I'm going to do that, push that cable down, and then we'll see if this thing boots up. Wish me luck. All right, so I got the cable installed in there. It does take a little bit of work to get it there. I would suggest using a plastic tool of some kind to help you along there. I'm just going to insert the battery in there and close up the lid. And now, I'll leave the, uh, the plastic on for a few more minutes here. I think we are assembled. Now, I don't know if this battery has a charge on it or not. So if I hit the power button here, oh, it does come on, perfect. So we are booting up. That is a good sign. It looks like it's got its own custom BIOS on board. And why don't we plug in one of my original Game Boy games here and fire it up and see what happens. There you go. Look at that. I actually built a Game Boy. That is awesome. Let's see if all the buttons work here now. There we go. So that's working. Up and down work, left and right. <clears throat> B and A both seem to be working. The start button works. Does it work? Yeah, there it goes. Yep. <laughs> so all is good. And as you can see right now, it's emulating or simulating, if you will, with its FPGA, a Game Boy Color, and it's adjusting the palette appropriately there. So I think we're actually in good shape. The speaker sounds okay. It does vibrate a bit in the case. I don't know if I just didn't get it installed right or not. So that's the only thing that doesn't feel as real to me, at least insofar as compared to the original here. But once it's screwed together, it's got a very nice feel to it. I'm actually pretty impressed with uh, how it feels overall. So a nice clone here. It feels legit. doesn't feel cheap. And the cartridges kind of go in really nice there as well. So good stuff. And I think I am ready to peel the plastic off on this and explore this a little bit more. So why don't we uh, do that now? Get that nice screen going here. I did get some fingerprints on it earlier. Um, and let's power it back up here, at least on that side. But yeah, seems to be pretty good. And right now, it looks like it actually has more screen real estate to play with. So we'll have to see if there is a menu or something that I can go into, which I believe there is an on-screen display. But I'll have to figure out how to get into that. So I'm going to go hunt around here and see uh, what I can find. And then we will explore this a little bit further. All right, I did some digging here. Let me turn it back on. And I did find that there is an on-screen display. So what I'm going to do here is just turn the volume down. If I push in the volume uh, rocker here, it actually pulls up a on-screen display. And there's pretty limited options here. So I can adjust the brightness, make the screen a little brighter here. I can also adjust the volume here, or I can use the uh, rocker switch here on the side. What I can also do, though, is change the core. So if I switch over to Game Boy and then go over to Save, this will make it into a regular Game Boy and not a Game Boy Color. So let me turn it off and turn it back on again. And now we've got that familiar green screen here. And the game is uh, running again, but now in the original Game Boy mode. And if I hit the button again, I think I get hit twice here. 
Um, it's a little screwed up here on screen right now, but this uh, setting right here is the display mode. It doesn't have much. It's got like a uh, pixel mode here where you've got a little uh, dot, dot matrix arrays like you had on the original there. And if I hit it again, it goes full screen, but I can't have it do those dots in the full mode. So it's got three modes here, X4, which I think is the proper aspect ratio, X4 with the dots, and then we've got the full screen mode here, which uses the full size of the display. So pretty cool. So let me uh, exit out of here real quick and hit the start button again. And granted, we're only playing one game here, but it does feel pretty good. The controls feel responsive. Uh, the sound is good out of it. It's got a headphone jack at the bottom in addition to that USB-C charging port there. Um, so, you know, it's no analog pocket because it only just does the Game Boy games. But hey, if you've got a bunch of these things with uh, carts, you can pop them in and play them. And you have the choice of experiencing them as an original Game Boy. I really like the palette they chose for this mode. It's got that familiar green, but it's all visible. <laughs> and if you want to go further with it, of course, you can uh, put it into the other modes here. You can see, though, when you go uh, into the full screen mode, you might lose a little bit here when you do it. So it's up to you which one you want to have. What's nice is they don't give you many choices, so it's pretty simple here to uh, adjust. And then to switch cores, you do have to reboot uh, to get that other core up and running. But pretty cool. It seems to be working quite well. Let me pop in now. I'm going to switch back over to the Game Boy Color mode because I do have an actual Game Boy Color game here. So I'm going to go pull up the menu here again and I'll switch it into GBC mode and save it. And I'll just uh, switch it off. And we'll pop the cartridge out and put another one in. By the way, there's no way to load ROMs on this unless you have a flash cartridge, which I do have, which we'll test in a second here. So now we're back in the color mode. And this is bust a move. And there we go, we've got color. And this game, of course, has its own color, not a color palette that it's getting applied to a black and white game here. Let's see how it looks. All right, we'll go through this menu here. Of course, this is one with the story, right? <laughs> All right, so here we go. This is bust the move, it looks like. Yeah, looks good. Gives you that Game Boy Color experience, and then again, we can adjust the display if we want. So we can go to, oops, wrong button there. Go up to the full screen mode if we want. So pretty cool. Yeah, I like it. All right, let's take a look at the EverDrive and see if that works. All right, so I've got my EverDrive GB here. This is one of the older EverDrive carts, not the newer ones that support save states and more advanced features, but we'll see if it works at least here. And look at that. Yep, it looks like it is up and running. Now, I'm going to load up Mario Land 2 because this was a game that uh, some of the community members patched to add color. So this is a good example of a game that um, was kind of in the homebrew space, if you will. So we'll let the EverDrive do its thing. It says erase here because what it does is it wipes out its flash memory, puts the game on that, and then it reboots. So it does take it a second to get the game loaded up here. But let's see if it works. So then it does the reboot, and there we go. There is Mario Land 2. And it looks like my save game is still functional there too. Oops, I gotta pick the game here, it looks like. There we go, go down to A. All right, so now it's working. Yeah. So all good. I don't play very well, but there you go. You can see how it works. All right, let me take a look at one other thing. I'm gonna switch it back into Game Boy mode and we'll plug the sound into my system here so you can see what it, or hear what it sounds like. Let's do that. So let's give Super Mario Land a go. I'll keep my mouth shut for a minute or two here so you can hear what it sounds like. So I think it sounds pretty good. I can't really tell much of a difference here between this and a real one. And all in, I'm pretty impressed with what this can do for the price point. So this is a pretty fun project and a very good deal. And you can get the satisfaction of building your own Game Boy and then playing it. I've left my original Game Boy Color here in its original state just because I didn't want to cut the case or ruin any of the original aspects to it, even though it's not perfect. So I was really pleased that I could build my own here and have essentially the display I was looking for along with a very 
uh, close to the original FPGA simulation of the hardware. And all in, I think it is a very nice alternative here that fits almost exactly the same in the hand as the original does. And the controls feel a little bit better just because they're newer. This, of course, is what, 25, 26 years old. So it's starting to feel a little bit uh, worn out, but this one feels brand new. It's certainly no analog pocket, as I mentioned. The pocket has much more that it can do, including loading cores for many other systems beyond just the Game Boy. So I can run my uh, Sega Genesis on here. I've got far more that I can do with the display modes here, including you know grayscale and simulating all the different Game Boy iterations that were out there. Um, but altogether, it's a much less expensive device than the Pocket. And if you're looking for a way to really enjoy your Game Boy games, whether you have an EverDrive or a bunch of cartridges kicking around, I think this is going to be a fun way to do it. They do have uh, firmware updates that come down from time to time. I don't think we're going to see much of a feature set uh, beyond what this has. The FPGA they built into this is not nearly as powerful as the two that are in the Pocket. So I think Game Boy is probably going to be where it lands insofar as what it can do. But if you're, again, looking for something that looks and feels and plays as accurate to the original as possible without being an original, I think this little kit will get you there. And I'm very pleased with uh, what you get here for the price point. That's going to do it for this one. Until next time, this is Lon Sybin. Thanks for watching. This channel is brought to you by the Lon.TV supporters, including Gold Level supporters Brian Parker, Budley, Hot Sauce and Video Games, Steve Green, and Amda Brown. If you want to help the channel, you can by contributing as little as a dollar a month. Head over to lon.tv slash support to learn more. And don't forget to subscribe. Visit lon.tv slash s.